ein. Romans chapter 9. And what I'd like to do is I'm going to be teaching through Romans 9, 19 through 29. And Romans 9, 19 through 29 really summarizes about the past three sessions we've been going over. So what I want to do is I want to step back a little bit, and I believe it was Russell yesterday who gave everybody permission to do that, that you can step on the guy behind you. So that's okay, just don't go forward. So I'm not going to step on them, but I do, I do want to look at Romans chapter 9 and say, hey, what's going on? So that way when we get down to the portion that we're getting to, verse 19 and through 29, that we know exactly what's going on. So if you can imagine how much history throughout the whole Old Testament there was with the nation Israel and how the Gentiles were nowhere to be found other than under God's wrath the entire time and all of the sudden there is a gospel from the Apostle Paul going out to the Gentiles. So we know that he's got to explain to everybody why that is. So Romans 9, 10, and 11 is to the Gentiles to explain what happened to Israel. So that's what we're, we're going over in these morning sessions. And as we go through what, what's going on here, Paul says in verse 1, he says, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have a great heaviness and continue, continual sorrow in my heart. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh who are Israelites. And then he goes, who, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. So he's going to explain what happens to them. So as he starts to explain, one, who Israel is, and they're not all Israel, which are Israel, he's referring to believing Israel, he is expecting objections. Think about Romans chapter 5 and Romans chapter 6. After you learn about justification by grace through faith, what's one of the first questions that you get from somebody? Well, you're saying I can do anything I want? Well, see, God knew man in his flesh was going to naturally ask that question in response to grace, so he answers it. Right there after he teaches you justification by faith, he answers the question. And what we have in Romans chapter 9 is questions that are brought up about what happened to Israel. And man's position in the flesh is, God, you can't do that. You can't stop dealing with the nation Israel right now. You just can't do it. And you see these questions come up. In verse 14 of Romans chapter 9, What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. So that really gets at the heart of the matter. Everybody realizes that when you question God, what are you accusing Him of? And unrighteousness, right? You're saying, look, I've got a, I've got a better idea than you do. And uh, let me give you that better idea in the form of a question. That's kind of how man does things sometimes. But as we go through here, we get more objections. When we see, what shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? And we get to verse 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose I have, have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore he hath mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he hardeneth, he, whom, whom he will, he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? So, when we look at these verses, we see these objections that people raise when they find out that God is not dealing with Israel during the dispensation of grace. Now, here's how my message is going to be structured. We're going to look at verses 19 and 20 and look at those questions. 
Then we're going to answer those questions by looking at verse 22 through 29. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take a step back. We're going to look at those questions, and we're going to look at them in light of how the Scriptures show us two of them. Then what we're going to do is once we, once we understand the thinking behind this, we're going to take a step back, and we're going to look at the bigger picture. And all that time, though, what I would like to do is contrast that off of the traditional view of how these verses work. Because when you look at Pharaoh, and it says, he, in whom he will, he hardeneth. The traditional view of what God is trying to, that people believe what God is trying to stay, say here is essentially that he creates things, and as he creates these things, he created some things just to throw away, and he created some things to keep. Because everybody knows that when people create stuff, they create stuff to throw away, right? But that's the traditional view of this is that, well, God's just going to do what He wants. Well, when we look at the verses, this, and it's been said this weekend already, Romans chapter 9 is not, it is not about your personal salvation. What Romans 9 is, is one of the best arguments you'll ever hear for dispensationalism. And when you look at it through the Scriptures, you'll see, which is what I'm going to try to prove to you today, that throughout time, God has used a principle of reshaping things in order to show mercy. And that's what it's about. It's actually about reshaping and not about making stuff to throw away and making stuff you're going to keep. So let's get into the verses. I just want to make a point because we're going to refer back to Pharaoh. And Dave made this point yesterday when it says, Therefore he hath mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. I'm going to give you some verses that you can go back and look at on your own time. But Exodus chapter 7, verse 13, 14, 22, and Exodus chapter 8, verse 15. The reason I give you those verses is because when you look at those verses, you're going to get a picture of Pharaoh. And God, did God harden Pharaoh's heart? He did. Why did he harden it? Because it was hardenable, right? And you'll actually see when you look at those passages that you'll see God hardened Pharaoh's heart, and you'll see that not only did God harden Pharaoh's heart, but it's just flat out stated in those verses that I give you that his heart was hardened, the result of that. And then it also says that Pharaoh hardened his heart. So when you look at Pharaoh there, you get this picture of what God's Word does, the way it's designed, is there's no neutral with God's Word. It goes out. It either hardens or it's going to give you light based on whether you're willing to accept what God says or not. So that's what these verses are saying. So when we get to verse 19, it says, Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Now you're probably saying, he stated that like it was a statement, and there's a question mark there. We'll get into that a little later. As he saith in Osi, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah crieth, Concerning Israel, though the number of children be of Israel, and as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will 
the Lord make upon the earth. And he said to Isaiah, and as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. Now, before we get started, I want to I want to talk about a, a real simple principle. And it's okay to admit things like this, but have, have you ever read through the Pauline epistles and you come across Old Testament references and you say, he really seems to take that out of context. Have, have you ever thought that before? Okay. It doesn't seem the point he's trying to make, if you go back there and look at it, that that's exactly what that was about. Well. While we get into this, what I want to explain to you is what the Apostle Paul does with those references many times, not every time, is he is going to point you back to a principle where he shows you something about the character of God, where God behaved this way in history when this happened, and just like he did that back then, he is doing that now. It is not the, exa the exact same situation now, but what it shows you is that God's character remained the same even though his dealings with man didn't, right? Isn't that one of the things we, we say about dispensational thought? God doesn't change, but his dealings with man does. Well, that's how these Old Testament references many times work. What he does is he sets up a parallel. He says, here is what's going on now. Here is what's going on in the past. And even though they are different, they are parallel in the way God is dealing with them. Okay? That principle is so helpful when it comes to understanding these things. So let's get into the objections in verse 20. Let's start in verse 19. Thou wilt say unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? So the question there is, is how can God find fault with man if he cannot resist his will? If God's going to have mercy on whom he has mercy, and he's going to harden whom he hardens, how can he find fault? Look at the next question. And the next question is even more important. Because notice what, how verse 20 starts. How does it start? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? So he basically says, you can ask those questions, but he says, nay, O man, right? He's like, oh, you poor little guy. Who are you that replies against God, which is the more important question? And then he asks this, shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? That's, that's one of those questions that, he answered a question with a question right there. Doesn't that bother you when people do that to you? <laughs> what if, so he, he asked this question. He says, he says, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed to him that formed it say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Now, what the Bible does, and thank God that it does this, is because if, if, if you're anything like me, I'm a little thick and I need things simple. So when I, when I read a passage like this, my, my, my first thought goes to, okay, this is traditionally how people view this and it seems to make sense why they view it that way. But it really doesn't because what God does is instead of just asking these questions, he's actually pointing you back to the Old Testament with each of these questions questions and with the answers so that you can go back to the Old Testament, search out what's going on, and then formulate what the answers to the questions are. So if you don't go to the Old Testament and read what's said here, you don't get to answer the questions, right? It's, he sets it up so he gives you these hints of where to go, and he tells, they're not really hints, they're pretty clear. He tells you where to go, and there you find the answer, and when you find the answer, you get the the question gets answered. It's kind of like a little scavenger hunt. It's an exciting Bible study if you, if you think about it. So when he says this, and he says, Shall the thing form say to him that, for, that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Now that's not a new question. Go to Isaiah chapter 29.
So it's an old question. And I want to I want to look at the heart of the question because that gets to what we're trying to learn about. In verse 13 of Isaiah chapter 29, he says, Wherefore saith the Lord, for as much as this people draw near to me with their mouth and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Therefore, behold, I will proceed to do a marvelous work among this people, even a marvelous work and a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise shall perish, and their understanding of their prudent men shall be hid. Woe unto them that seek deep to hide their counsel from the Lord, and their works are in the dark, and they say, Who seeth us, and who knoweth us? Note verse 16. Surely your turning of things upside down shall be esteemed as the potter's clay, for shall the work say of him that made it, he made me not. Or shall the thing framed say of, of him that framed it, he hath no understanding. You see that's an old question there? Go to Isaiah chapter 45. We're going to get a little bit more insight. Isaiah chapter 45. <laughs> I was turning fast and I skipped right over Isaiah and I was in Jeremiah 45 and I'm like, that looks like a very small chapter compared to what I was looking at earlier. So Isaiah 45, verse 9 says, Woe unto him that striveth with his maker. Let the potsherds strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him that fashioned it, What makest thou? Or thy work he hath no hands. Woe unto him that saith unto his father, What begottest thou? Or to the woman. What hast thou brought forth? What I want you to notice in verse 9, so the, the very question itself that man brings up, why hast thou made me thus? In Romans chapter 9, it's actually stated this way. It says, Shall the thing formed say, say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? When you look at Isaiah chapter 45 verse 9, what it teaches you, what's the heart behind that? What's the heart behind the question? I heard it. It's striving. That's it. So the very question itself is striving. Now, you've got to find this ironic. Wait, you can't do this, God, because nobody's resisted your will. Why hast thou made me thus is striving with him. What does it mean to strive with somebody? What would you say it might be concerning somebody's will if you're striving with them? The resistance, right? If I strive with you, I'm resisting you. So the very question itself, the very question of why, hast thou why, why have you made me this way, is actually striving, it's actually a resistance of his will, right? So get to verse 21 of Romans chapter 9, because here we're going to get into the meat of it. Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. Now, the, the, way, the way a Calvinist would view this verse is that God's going to make some things to throw away, and he's going to make some things to keep, essentially. And that is, this is actually a reference back to Jeremiah 18. So go to Jeremiah 18. Jeremiah 18. And we'll start in verse 1. It says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. So I want to stop right there. So if you're thinking about this as God made some things to throw away and some things to keep, in Jeremiah chapter 18, there's a, there's, there's a very specific 
word that he uses. The clay was marred in the hands of the potter, so he made it, what? Again. He remade it, right? When it was marred, what he did was he remade it. It wasn't, I'm going to make this and whoosh, gone, and I'm going to make this, I'm going to love it. What happened was when things weren't the way he had wanted man to react to things, he remakes it for him, right? Now, let's get the context of Jeremiah because I just wanted to stop there and make that but, point, but we're going to get into what this is really about. Verse 5 says, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, O house of Israel. So he's seen what the potter's doing. Now he's going to speak to Israel. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Now, verse 6 gives you an indication about something. When it says, O house of Israel, is it speaking to an individual person about their personal salvation? No, it's not. Now let's read the next verse. O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. You notice how that verse started? You notice how that verse ended? O house of Israel. You can't miss it. Verse 7. At one, what instant shall I speak concerning a... We're still talking about a nation here. And concerning a kingdom, to pluck it up and to pull it down and to destroy it. So I can do whatever I want with a nation or a kingdom. Can God do that? Does he have the right to do it? He sure does. The next verse, verse 8, If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. At what instant shall I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it? If it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them. So what's he talking about here? He's talking about the house of Israel, and he's talking about a kingdom, and he can do whatever he wants with them. But what he does is he references that in verse 8, if that nation against whom I have pronounced turned from evil, what will happen? I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. Now, go over to chapter 19, and then we're going to summarize looking at this a little bit. Chapter 19, <coughs> verse 11, And shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Even so will I break this people and this city as one breaketh a potter's vessel. So what is he going to break when he breaks the potter's vessel? What's it? This people. So he's talking about a people, and he's talking about this city specifically here. If you get back down to verse 15, it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will bring upon the city and upon all her towns all the evil that I have pronounced against it because they have hardened their necks that they might not hear my words. You know what's wonderful about God? He chooses to work with man, right? If he didn't choose to work with man, what would we be? But what this tells you in Jeremiah, one, it's about people and about nations and about how he can form kingdoms and he can throw them down based off of how they react to what he tells them to do, right? If you think about Israel and their covenant relationship, if you do this, this happens. If you do good, good things are going to happen to you. If you obey me, this is going to happen. If you do bad, wrath, curses, all those things. So when you look at the whole Old Testament, <clears throat> What you see is you see those cycles of judgment as Israel follows idolatry, right? That's a, just a real simple way to sum things up. Israel doesn't believe God. They fall into idolatry. They don't obey Him. So bad things happen to them. But God is merciful, so what is He always doing? 
He's reshaping those things so that he can have mercy on them, right? We'll get into the mercy issue a little bit more later. But when you look at the Old Testament and you look at Israel, he does that all the time. He reshapes things to allow him to have mercy on them. You know, David taught on the delay principle yesterday, right? And what I'm, what I'm hoping you're starting to see is that this delay principle, he delays judgment so he can have mercy. Well, he also reshapes things for the same purpose. And they fit perfectly together. And just to fast forward a little bit, if you were thinking about the Old Testament here, the delay principle happens between here and here. God delays his judgment so that he can have mercy on them. Now, while he's doing that, he does reshape things through judgment throughout here. But when you really get to it, and this is just foreshadowing a little later, the, 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 the reshaping principle happens here. Okay? So, let me illustrate it by walking. In a time, what God does is he delays his judgment throughout a period of time so that he can have mercy on people. Eventually, that period of time comes to an end. And sometimes what he chooses to do is to reshape things in that time period, or at the end of that, so that he can have mercy again. Okay? So, I hope what you're seeing as we get through here, let's go back to Romans chapter 9, that if we follow the verses and if we go to where he points us to, we end up learning that he's talking about a people and he's talking about a nation. So what we end up with is we're not ending up on a treatise of how personal salvation happens here. We're ending up with why God reshapes things sometimes and that it is well within his character to do so because he has done so in the past. So look at the nation Israel. Has he reshaped things with them? Yes. Had he done it in the past? Yes. He can take this city and it can be a vessel of wrath. What's a vessel for? It holds things. So the vessel, the only thing it's good for is to hold his wrath. Or it could be a vessel of mercy. A vessel that he can put his mercy into and that that vessel, why, why do you have a vessel? Because it's going to take that mercy somewhere else, right? I put water in a vessel so it can be distributed. So he's going to have mercy on these vessels of mercy so they can hold his mercy and it can be, what was supposed to Israel supposed to do? They were going to be a blessing, right? Romans chapter 9. So verse 21, Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Now if we look at that in the Old Testament, it says of the same lump. Within Israel, okay, you had believing Israel and unbelieving Israel, right? Now, if you had to guess, was unbelieving Israel a vessel of honor? No. Okay, good. They're the vessel of dishonor. So, hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? So we've got the same lump, Israel. We've got a vessel unto honor, believing Israel. And we've got a vessel unto dishonor. Now we're going to go back in the passage and forward in the passage just to show you some things because it said in the beginning of the passage, they are, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. What's that a reference to? The little flock, right? There's some that believe and there's some that don't. You get down to verse 29, except the Lord of Sabot had left us a seed. Verse 28, or I'm sorry, verse 27, a remnant shall be saved. So if you look at the, 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 book, the chapter of Romans chapter 9, it's kind of like a funnel. It starts off with Israel and he starts down to believing Israel. So of this same lump, he can make a vessel of honor and to dishonor. The next verse, verse 22, says this. What if, this is another question, what if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering? Does that sound like the delay principle you learned yesterday? 
the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. So, one other thing I want you to know about verse 22. What if God, willing to show his wrath, is God always willing to show his wrath? Yeah, that's what it shows. And by the way, wrath is man's default position, right? Do you, do you really have to create man to incur wrath? He does it all on his own, right? So the default position is always wrath. At any point in time, God would be justified in dispensing judgment and wrath on Israel, mankind, anybody. He's always justified in doing so. So that delay principle teaches us that the longer he delays that, that's just mercy. So that, default, that de default position is always wrath. So he talks about endured with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. What do you think it means to be fitted to destruction? Does that, does that sound like, hey, I made this to throw it away. I made it so I could throw it against a wall. No, it's fitted for destruction, right? The end result is that it's fit for destruction. Is, did Israel believe? No. So that was a vessel of wrath. They were fit for destruction. If you think back to Jeremiah, it was marred in the hands of the potter. They hardened their hearts. Isn't that what it said? They hardened their hearts. How workable is hard clay? Right? There gets a point where hard clay can't be worked with anymore. So what is it? It's just fitted for wrath for destruction. So I get rid of it and I start reshaping things. Verse 23, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So what you have happen in verse 22 through 24 is we see a little bit of a shift. We started out with the nation Israel, and he's basically saying the same thing I did with the nation Israel by delaying and reshaping things, he can now do with the Gentiles, correct? Because in time past, what were the Gentiles? Fit for wrath. But now he's going to start working with them. So the way he says this is, what if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory. Now verse 24, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So why does it end with a question mark? Because of what it started with. What if, right? He's actually answering the question with a question, but the question is the what if, and he gives you the statement. Does that make sense? So he, he, he says, what if? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory. Even us, whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So not only can he do that, not only did he reshape things with the nation Israel over and over and over again, but he's well within his rights to do so and to set Israel down and to go ahead and work with the Gentiles. It's, it's plain as day there. As he saith also in Osi, I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved. So he goes back and he gets into the, the remnant. So he takes a step out to tell you God can do the same thing with the Gentiles. So if you're wondering, hey, what happened to Israel? God can't do that. We go back and ask, ask the questions. Thou wilt say unto me, why doth he yet find fault for who hath resisted his will? Nay, O oh man, but who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it? When we go back 
and we look at those questions. Who hath resisted his will? Well, we see the nation Israel throughout their entire history resisting his will. So why does he find fault? Because they resisted his will. Right? The, the questions are wrong. Well, why did you make me this way? Wait a minute. I made you this way, and then I, I reshaped you, and I sent the curses, not out of hate and wrath, but honestly, God, when he passes judgment on the nation, Israel is actually merciful to them because he's trying to get them back on track. Similar to spanking, right? Spank to repentance. So he's trying to get them back on track, so it actually ends up to be merciful. Let me show you something. If, you, if we go back a little bit, verse 17 says, For the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, For this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore he hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. What I want you to see in verse 17 and 18 is there's this issue of power and there's issue of mercy, right? So what God does is he, he, he shows his power through Pharaoh, and in that situation, he has mercy on the nation Israel, right? Go to, go, as I was studying for this, I, I found Psalm 136. Go to Psalm 136. <clears throat> So Psalm 136 is about God and His mercy, okay? Now, there, there's something that I think you'll, you'll get a kick out of here. Psalm 136, O oh, give mercy unto the Lord, for He is good, for His mercy endureth forever. O oh, give thanks unto the God of gods, for His mercy endureth forever. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for His mercy endureth endureth forever. What do you think the point of this chapter might be? All right. His mercy is going to endure forever, right? To him who alone doth great wonders, for his mercy endureth forever. To whom by wisdom made the heavens, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that stretched out the earth above the waters, for his mercy endureth forever. To him that made great lights, for his mercy endureth forever. The sun to rule by day, for his mercy endureth forever. His, it's his mercy, isn't it? Now look at verse 10. To whom that smote Egypt in their firstborn, for his mercy endureth forever, and brought Israel out from among them, for his mercy endureth forever, and with a strong hand and with a stretched out arm, for his mercy endureth forever, divided the Red Sea. Now you get down to verse 15. Overthrew Pharaoh, and to him which smote great kings, verse 17, verse 18, and slew famous kings. And verse 20, and Og, the king of Bashan. He goes through all these people that God defeated, that he showed his power. But then it says his mercy endureth forever. What does that show you about God when he shows his power? His plan is mercy. It, it, it endures forever. So, what we get to with Romans chapter 9, which is very important, and I want to close with a couple things here, is go to Romans chapter 9. <coughs> Verse 25 through 29, he says, As he saith in O.C., I will call them my people which were not my people, and her beloved which was not beloved. When you look at the Old Testament reference to that, Jesus divorced Israel, or God divorced Israel, correct? So he divorces Israel. So are they his people? No. But then does he bring them back? Yes. And he says, I will call them my people which were not my people. So my people is Israel, which were not my people. Guess who that is? Israel. And her beloved, which was not beloved. Which was not beloved. So he's saying, just as I did that with Israel, guess what I can do with the Gentiles? He can do the same thing with them, right? And he continues that thinking down through verse 29. 
Now, with that in your head, what I want you to do is I want you to think about David talked about yesterday with Noah and the delay principle of 120 years. I want you to think about the Tower of Babel today. Romans chapter 1. Go to Romans chapter 1. Because we see that he did this with Israel. But even before Israel, we learn in Romans chapter 1. In verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who do what? Hold the truth. Verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it to them. So is there any question that man knew what he was supposed to do? There's no question. He knew what he was supposed to do. So man, Noah gets off the ark. What's he supposed to do? Go out and replenish the earth. What happens? They get together and they build a city. Okay, kind of opposite, right? Go out and do something, but no, we're going to get together and we're going to build the city. So what does God do? He scatters them, confounds the languages. He reshapes things, right? Look, you don't want to do what I'm going to tell you to do. I'm going to reshape it, and you're not going to have a choice. So he shows his power by reshaping things and confounding the languages. And then in Genesis chapter 12, what does he do? Calls out for the purpose of what? to show mercy. You see how that works? So you have this long delay and then all of a sudden no more. The clay is so hard I'm going to make a new lump. And he reshapes things so that he can have mercy. Think about Acts chapter 7. What happens with Stephen? They stone Stephen. It's too hard to work with. Uncircumcised of heart. Stiff-necked people. What's he going to do? Reshape things. Here comes the Apostle Paul. Just as he did in Genesis chapter 11, he can do so in Acts chapter 9. It's not out of his character. When you look at that and you follow the logic in those verses, doesn't it just show you how wonderful God's plan is? And doesn't it make you just want to praise Him for His mercy? Because even when He reshapes things, He does so that He can have mercy. He's just, it's just like the delay principle. It's just, it's just another chance for people who don't deserve another chance. And you know what the reshaping principle is? It's another chance for people who don't deserve another chance. That is completely opposite of making something to throw away. The verses in Romans chapter 9 and through these fleshly objections, these questions that we see, don't teach us about personal salvation. They teach us about how God reshapes things, delays things, so that He can continue to have mercy on man instead of giving him his just reward. Let me give you one verse that I just found fascinating, and I'll close with this verse. And I think this shows the heart of God, and I think it, this, this verse isn't directly related. You ever find a verse, you're like, oh, that verse just shows something about God and His heart. And it, it, this verse isn't directly related. It doesn't have the word potter in it. doesn't have the word clay. doesn't have any of those in it. But it just shows God's character. And it's it's um, Acts chapter 17, verse 26. And it simply says this, And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Now look at verse 27 that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after Him and find Him, though He be not far from every one of us. Doesn't that just line up perfectly with that reshaping principle? Why does He do all this stuff? Why did, what's the whole point? 
that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Let's thank him for that. Lord, we thank you so much for your mercy. We thank you for the love that you have for us. We thank you that you have reshaped things so that you can have mercy on us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.